Hi everyone, it's Becky here. Welcome to another new video on my YouTube channel. Today is a lovely summer day here in Vancouver, and I'm on a car ride with my parents and family friends. We're going to Vancouver. We're gonna stroll around Stelly Park and then the West End area. Here is a view of Foss Creek, the Science World, and the Main Street area. And we're going into downtown now. And the traffic is going to get so busy starting from here as we uh, drive into downtown. So it's really hard to find a parking spot in downtown. But here we found a, a paid parking somewhere close to the English Bay Beach. These are the amazing laughter statues and the urban landscape of English Bay area. So we arrived before noon and the beach is not that busy yet. Here I am, really happy to be out here. So as a teenager and in my 20s, I don't go out that often. But now, these days, as I'm looking for more and more inspirations for my sketchbooks and paintings, I need to come out more often to enjoy nature and also feel more balanced. So now, as my parents and family friends are chatting, sitting at a bench, I'm wandering away from them and try to find a peaceful spot to sit by myself and sketch something. So I found a bench in a shaded area, sitting down here and enjoying this little body of water. It's called uh, the Lost Lagoon. So I was planning to sketch the beach that we passed by, but then uh, I felt that it was too busy and um, too noisy and too hot. Um, I like this little spot better. So today I feel like doing something calm and meditative and not a super busy beach or urban landscape. So this is my current sketchbook or art journal. I've been working on it for about two months and a half now, sketching almost every single day of my daily life surroundings. And I sketch everything on these pages from real life observations, not from photos. All right, so now I'm ready to begin sketching the Lost Lagoon, the little body of water, um, the mountains in the distance, and the little forest in the middle on the other side of the water. So the drawing speed you're about to watch right now is two times faster than my actual drawing speed in real life. So facing the blank sheet of paper, I'm using hand gestures and visualization um, to manage the different chunks of areas. So I just drew this horizontal line that defines the bottom of the little land on the other side of the lagoon. Now I'm drawing a little peak of the mountain in the distance and the contour outline of the forest in the middle ground, overlapping in front of the mountains. So the height of these trees making up this little forest is very uneven. So I'm paying attention to the ups and downs of the contour outline here. This is a good mix of evergreen trees that are more pointy and deciduous trees that are more round. So a lot of deciduous trees are actually around uh, the middle to the bottom part of this forest. The top contour outline is mostly just the evergreens. Yeah, so now I am adding some round puffy shapes of uh, deciduous trees like willows, maples, maybe a couple of apple trees. So now I am focused more on the uh, separation of the single clusters of each tree and not you know, getting caught up with the details like adding too much textures for each single tree. So just focus on the puffy shapes and the cone shapes of each tree, trying to separate uh, the much better to give a sense of layering. So roughly there are about two to three layers of trees, um, three rows, two to three rows making up this forest. All right, so now I need to take a break from drawing those far distance details. Now I see two ducks, probably a pair, waddling around me in the bush and I wanna capture them. So the drawing speed of this duck is actually in real-time speed. 
Um, yeah, so when animals are around me, I like to draw really, really fast, focusing on their general contour outlines and then the inner body texture details, like the feathery feel around, uh, around the back. Now I'm drawing the other one. This one is deeper in the bush, a little further away from me, so it's smaller. Starting with our head and the body is a little foreshortened, kind of like a leaf, and then these quick squiggly lines for the feathers. All right, so it took me about one minute to draw these two ducks. Uh, when you draw more and have more experience in sketching, you will naturally draw faster with confidence. All right, so don't worry too much about your speed right now. And now I am adding this tall, wild grass. So there is a main stalk in the very middle of this grass and then um, several more smaller stalks separating from the middle one. Now I see two birds uh, passing by overhead as so I just added them. So my sketching is always uh, capturing multiple moments in a given amount of time, like 30 minutes or so. Now I'm using very loose and organic squiggles to draw these grass by the bank of the lagoon and some more wild grass springing up from the bank. So as always, I'm trying to summarize the masses of grass and leaves uh, like over here instead of trying to copy what's out there. Okay, just a couple more uh, little twigs sprouting from the stalk of this tall wild grass here. A bit of accentuation for the middle stalk there with heavier lines. And then making the uh, definition of the bank even clearer here on the lower left side. So now I am about to make a pretty important line and going upwards towards the right that gives a really compelling sense of space and also distance for the lagoon and the surrounding area. So this loose line that I'm making right now is the bank. And then on the, uh, in the middle ground is the willow tree in the middle of the trail here. Again, when I'm drawing trees, bushes, and grass, my lines are always very loose and not so perfect because in nature, you can hardly find a perfect leaf or a perfect grass. And also using uh, numerous lines and accentuations on the bottom of the willow tree to suggest the shaded area and some more grass underneath with a loose organic shape right there and then another line going down towards the middle here. This is the trail, okay? Another curve there on the very far right. So now I'm moving back to the body of water here to add a couple of geese paddling very leisurely and enjoying the sunshine too. Okay, so now I'm going back to the forest area. So now it's time for some more precise details like the bottom of these trees on the first row. And a couple more details up there for the mountain, the snow caps. And now going back to the water area to draw another geese, just to give that one a partner. Yeah, just keeping the outline of the birds very simple because they're, they're in the distance. It could be a very simple suggestion of two water birds. Accentuate the bank area on the other side of the water with a denser line there. And then switching to a gentle hand pressure to add the ripples on the surface of the lagoon. And these lines are very loose, kind of like uneven. Just follow the rhythm that I see of the surface of water. So keeping my hand pressure really gentle throughout the whole uh, surface of water for the ripples. So the lines are uh, very mild and not competing with the other major outlines in this landscape. And again, getting kind of wild again, drawing these uh, grass, the stalks sprouting from the earth so I see both dried grass and some fresh green ones. And for some reason, uh, I'm not so sure why, I love sketching 
uh, ordinary landscape better than those perfect landscapes that you see on postcards and calendars. Uh, so I love sketching these, uh, you know, thought looking shapes of grass and leaves, um, right? It's just like the, the nature of the world. The world is never perfect, but it's still beautiful, full of spirit. Yeah, and keep adding some more of these rustic lines to fill this uh, grassy area. And adding some little tiny circles to suggest the, uh, the little pebbles on the trail, scattered on the trail, and little dots as well for the sand kernels. So as you can see for different areas in nature, we can use uh, different kinds of lines and little shapes to suggest what those areas are. And now I'm writing down the location is the Lost Lagoon at Stelly Park. And now I want to put down today's date and the date inside the circle. So it's a Friday, June the 23rd. And those little fluffy clouds hugging the mountains over there, I think they kind of look like popcorns, really cute. So again, I'm using gentle hand pressure to get those little loose shapes done. I don't want these clouds to look too strong to compete with the foreground details. Again, they're very much like popcorns um, overlapping with each other. And again, when we're sketching the different elements in the landscape, um, you have to be mindful about using different hand pressure to depict the various kind of things. So for the forest, I, I might use like a medium to hard pressure to uh, suggest the definitions of trees. Yeah, so this is all done with the same pen. I'm using the Windsor and Newton brand fine liner pen, 0 0.8 tip. So now the drawing part is done. So I'm just putting my pen away and getting my watercolors and two water brushes out. I'm using the Etcher watercolors. I've been using this for two years, two years and a half already. Just getting this ready so you can see my mixing area. And I'm grabbing my two Holbein brand water brushes. So as usual, I'm gonna start painting the sky area first. I'm wetting the sky area with clear water by squeezing very lightly of my large tip Holbein water brush. Now I'm adding this super diluted cadmium yellow because it's um, kind of a little later in the afternoon and I see a warm yellow glow from the middle to the bottom of the sky. For the top part, this is a mix of cerulean blue and a little bit of cobalt blue. And I'm merging the blue with the yellow to form a kind of a turquoise in the middle of the sky. And adding a bit of more cerulean blue for the top part containing less water. So there's a bit of value change right there and just keep the sky really loose. I'm trying to balance my sketchbook and my paint palette on my lap and it's challenging to uh, make a really perfect wash. And we don't have to be perfect when painting watercolors. Just, you know, do all your best, let the paint flow without controlling way too much. Okay, so now I am grabbing a little bit of lemon yellow and dilute it with a lot of water. So, so this is just mostly water. Uh, it's kind of like an underpainting for the water because it's kind of like in the afternoon, the water has a bit of uh, reflection from the mellow glow of the sunshine. And same for the pathway. So when painting very much like everything in the world, I very rarely just start the first layer with the uh, original color of that thing, the color that you see on the surface. I always like to try to see deeper of the lightest town that's on the very bottom or in the middle of those values. So after that, I'm doing wet onto wet right now, grabbing a little bit of lime green, mix it with um, yellow ochre, wet onto wet, onto the underpainting of the grassy area. So again, just let the yellow green flow into the underpainting. And for this area, I'm mixing a little bit more yellow ochre leaving a lot of areas of the previous layer kind of unpainted and just let it dry a little bit before coming back to add some darker values for the grassy area. 
and I just wetted those trees in the distance with a little clear water and ready to play with the different values or tones of green. So these willow trees and or these deciduous trees in the uh, in the front row are more of a really vibrant yellow green. So this is a mix of uh, like cadmium yellow with a bit of uh, lime green. Again, this is kind of like an underpainting for the forest area. Those greens are not the final or the original colors of the trees. I want everything to have a nice glow early here in the beginning stage. So if you add the mid and dark tones of, for, for the objects in the uh, very early stage, it's very hard to achieve a sense of fluidity or luminosity for the things you're painting, especially when you're painting a landscape and things on a sunny day. Okay, again, I'm letting the, uh, the forest area to dry off a little bit. Now, the uh, underpainting of the water area is very much dried. So now I just mix cobalt blue, cerulean blue with a little bit of royal purple to get this kind of a muted blue for the lapping water using thick brush strokes leaving some uh, gaps of the underpainting in between these brush strokes. And now as I'm moving to the middle part of the water, my brush stroke is getting uh, thinner by putting lighter pressure with my hand and also the tang of the muted blue is also diluted with more water. It's getting harder and harder to see the details of the lapping water as we move here into the far distance. So your brush strokes don't have to be that clear anymore as in the foreground area. And as usual, mountains in the far distance, they have a really lovely blue town. So this is a mix of cerulean blue and cobalt blue, about half and half. Uh, still having a bit of saturation, not super muted. Yeah, just painting the, the peak area. And mixing more cobalt blue with uh, royal purple for some more intense contrast for the water here in the uh, foreground area. Yeah, a bit more contrast. So you can always add uh, some more contrast when the previous layer is dried off a little bit. If you're working wet on super wet, your brush strokes are gonna get faded out. So a lot of times you just have to wait a little longer to add the next layer to achieve the, uh, the visual effect that you want, right? Especially if we're painting uh, lapping water, you don't want your brush strokes to fade out. Just grabbing a little bit of leftover yellow green as a reflective color on the edge of the little land on the other side of water, a little bit more. Yeah, water always has reflections of its surroundings. Yeah, just trying to add contrast a little bit more in the far distance. Yeah, a little heavier lapping water here in the middle ground with leftover uh, bluish purple here. And also keeping my brush strokes, the paint pretty much diluted for these uh, ripples there in the far distance and keep the lines, the brush strokes really thin. Okay, that's very much it for the water. And now I'm shading these puffy popcorn shaped clouds with a leftover bluish gray. Yeah, pretty much diluted. Just around the bottom of these little spherical shapes of clouds. And just keep it simple. Okay, so now as the, uh, the first layer for the forest is very much dried, I'm ready to add some strong colors. So this is a mix of viridian green and a little bit of yellow ochre. Yeah, just punching these colors on with bold brush strokes. Some traces of brush marks are fine to depict the foliage texture. And keep adding more. Yeah, this is very much the same color, but I'm playing with water control. So every single brush stroke has a slight different value of this um, medium green. Okay, so that's it the, uh, for the mid-tones. Now I am 
She's adding a bit of brownish purple for that special tree there in the distance popping out. And a little bit of um, leftover yellow orange on the bottom for a little pathway on the bottom of the forest. Now it's time for the highest contrast for the forest. So this is very much just viridian green containing less water compared to the previous layer. Mostly for those evergreens in the forest having more mid and dark tones. And for these deciduous trees here um, in the front two rows, the green value is lighter compared to the evergreens. So yeah, so you really have to kind of analyze your color scheme, spend a little bit of time and really slow down and see the different values. Okay, so in between these puffy trees, I see um, shaded areas. So this is very much Viridian green with a little bit of burnt sienna mix in to get a shade color of green. And also another layer of purple there for that tree, for that special tree. Now for this willow tree, it has a lot of yellow tones. So mostly yellow ochre and um, a little bit of lime green to get it done. And that's very much it for the forest area. Now we need more contrast for the uh, foreground, the grassy area. Okay, so now just kind of adjusting the placement of my sketchbook on my lap, grabbing a bit of uh, verdant green. So verdant green is very, very handy when painting landscapes, those uh, lush greeneries. Okay, this is very much pure uh, verdant green, maybe with a little bit of um, yellow green mix in, wet onto wet, a bit of yellow orange for some dried grass in between. And I really love uh, the dashes of yellow orange over there is it makes the grassy area look more lively this way. And some more varying green in small dashing brush strokes to depict the, uh, the thin branches of the willow tree there. Yeah, and some more viridian green along the line of the bank for a bit of contrast there. Okay, now I'm adding the shade color of green. So this is viridian green with a bit of burnt sienna mix in. The more burnt sienna you mix into viridian green, the darker the green shade is. So when painting a landscape, most of the time I think we need to add you know, some heavy weight for the, for the foreground area using um, more concentrated colors or shades. Yeah, and I'm just blending on a little bit of uh, raw umber to show the earth in between. It's just not full of abundant grass. There's a bit of earth showing. Yeah, just grabbing some leftover mid and dark green to paint this uh, wild grass. In the foreground here, saying hi to the viewer. Yeah, so these little twigs are kind of like little arms waving at us. And just painting in this color with little dots of my medium tip water brush. Yeah, a little bit more around the tips. So again, because this is an uh, a foreground object. I like to spend a bit more time uh, making it look more refined and sharp. Okay, now it's time for the lovely shadows on the pathway and also onto the grassy area. So this is my own mix of gray with um, um, cobalt blue, royal purple, and a bit of green. Yeah, so these are the, uh, the shadows of the trees on the uh, right side of the pathway. But for the grassy area, I'm not using the gray. Um, I'm using the dark shade of green left over in my palette. Mixing some more blue and royal purple together for the shadow on the, on the pathway. And at the same time, adding more refined details for this grassy area. I like to paint in a very impressionistic way, especially for uh, the colors in the foreground. Now it's time to add a bit of um, 
burnt sienna mixed with raw umber to paint the wild ducks. And those are the geese adding a bit of a little shadow underneath the geese body in the water. So they're actually floating in the water, not in the air. And now it's time for some final polish, some more dark tones with very small brush strokes. So when I'm doing final polish, my brush strokes are almost invisible. Um, adding mostly shaded colors because shaded colors, especially on a sunny day, is very minimal, but they should be there. So for a sunny day landscape, we shouldn't just use bright and vibrant warm colors. They should be always cold colors to give contrast, to um, really suggest a realistic uh, warm sunny day. And now I see I need to add a bit more shade tones for the full rest there on the other side of the water. Um, yeah, of course, containing less water. Viridian green was a bit of burnt sienna mix in, especially for those cone-shaped evergreens in the distance. And really pushing those uh, round trees on the bottom forward with this contrast. Yeah, and I think that's very much it. Here is a look of my finished sketch. So thank you so much for watching this video, everyone. If you like it, please click like and leave me a comment below. Subscribe to my channel for weekly updates. I try to update my channel with two to three new videos every week. Bye everyone, see you soon.